Like, how are white people the devil? When I came to America, white people didn't hit me. You did. White people didn't belittle me. You did. White people didn't tell me that I'm nothing. You did. White people didn't try to, like, harm me. You did. So if white people are the devil, why were you acting like one? You get me? Now it transformed from being people that you should have no parts of to being people that now you should be concerned with because they're mentally ill. I'm just taking you through the process of me kind of like being a foreign black person, right? And I know this might be a lot a tough for people to hear because what I learned is that when it comes to conversations like this, which is why I avoid it at all costs, I realize that it's so charged emotionally that even if you're telling the truth and it's the real truth of what you experience, if it doesn't fit into a particular narrative, people want to shut it down. They want to kill it. You know, no, you're not supposed to say that. No, you're only supposed to speak in this way. Again, this is the whole point why this conversation needs to happen so that this whole group thing, this whole, you know, fake kumbaya thing can stop because it's not the truth. It's really just not the truth. There are people that have different experiences, right? I'm I'm going to have a conversation that I've been avoiding having for I don't know how long, but um, it needs to be had, right? Because especially as I look at that direction that things are going, it needs to be discussed. So I have a question and this, this conversation is really designed to talk to the um, black skinned community, okay? And the reason I'm saying black skinned community is because living in America, you have to understand that when someone says, when you hear a lot of conversations and they say black people this, black people that, it took me a very long time to understand that the reason, especially if you're a foreign black person, the reason you're, you may be looking at this and saying, what is black people or what were you getting this information from? That is African American culture oftentimes. Oftentimes black, um, in, in America, African American people tend to not like to be called African American. Trust me, it took me a while to learn this, years. Many actually prefer to be called black. So because they prefer to be called black, they use that interchangeably. So they might say black or black American, you follow? Or African American. But they identify themselves by their skin color. Whereas if you're a foreign black person, you identify yourself by your nationality, your ethnicity. And um, if you're obviously on the continent of Africa, one of the various countries, you might identify yourself by your tribe, right? So this is a very different way of viewpoint of seeing yourself. The problem with it is because in America, um, the identity is the skin color. It drags a lot of different ethnicities and cultures of black skin people into the conversation. So my question would be this, it's why do you call yourself black? I want you guys to really think about this. Like, why do you call yourself black? Like what's the, where does that concept come from? Like why? Because you, you can search anything, black community, black culture, black this. Why do you call yourself black? Why? And when I've posed this question specifically to black American people, what you'll always hear, this is what they see me as. This is what they think of me as, okay? Now, guys, this is what gets me about this because in America, if you've been here, and if you've been raised around black American culture, familiar with black American culture, um, and it depends on what part of the country I had to learn you're from, right? And the Northern States, I learned that it's more laxed. Um, but the Southern it's, you'll, you'll feel a lot more of, um, the segregation and you know, that oppression and that anger. And this is not to be stereotypical, but depending on what part of the United States you are is your experience with that particular demographic. It took me a while to understand this, especially being a Haitian foreigner, that was in the 90s, you know, fighting for my life. Um, when we were just foreign people, just coming to this country, just looking for an opportunity, um, we had to deal with essentially not being welcomed. It's one thing not to be welcomed. I think a lot of people can get over that. It was the being attacked for being Haitian, right? We had to deal with that. And having to go through that and live through that, what I later learned and understood is that this is more of a demographic thing in the southern part of the United States. Because as I began to have relationships with African Americans or black Americans that were from the northern part of the state, specifically like Connecticut, um, you know, Massachusetts, even New York, like in those areas, it was a completely different experience. So, you know, if you do still harbor some ill feelings towards, you know, African Americans because of your experience in the 90s, understand that that's a particular demographic of African Americans that you dealt with. They were not speaking and their behavior was not speaking on behalf of um, all African-Americans everywhere, 
right? Now, I was one of those people that really believed that when they said, you know, we don't like y'all Haitians and go back to Haiti, I literally thought because they were saying black versus those or Yangs versus those, it created this mentality that no, you're speaking for every single African American. So what I did and what most people in my culture you know, did is that we self segregated. If you have such a problem with Haitians to the point where you're going to assault us physically, then we want no parts of you. So outside of environments where I was forced to deal with African Americans or black Americans, uh, mainly school, like those type of environments, um, I stayed away completely. And most of the people that I grew up with stayed away com completely, tried to not attend events that, you know, were particularly black American quote unquote events, like just avoided the culture completely because that experience in the nineties clearly said that you have a problem with Haitians and I'm not interested interested in co-mingling with your culture whatsoever. Now, how unfair would that be by the experience of this small few of African Americans um, and their biases to completely say that this is the mentality, this is the thought process of every single African American, you know, in, in America, like this is them, right? And there are still Haitians till this day, and it's not just Haitians, there are many foreign black skinned people, foreigners, um, that want absolutely nothing to do with the black American culture, right? And a lot of it has to do just the 90s. When I when I talk to different um, foreign black people and I listen to what they're saying, what I'm finding out is a lot of it has to do with like the 90s, like this whole African, you know, booty scratchers, you know, we're told that we eat cats and we came off the boat. It was just a, a lot of pure ignorance, right? And ignorance is one thing, but hatred is another, you follow? And what I felt growing up was hatred. What I felt growing up from African-American was hatred. And not only did I experience ignorance, I also experienced hatred. And then I experienced that hatred turning into violence. Now you have to understand, Haitians crossed, um, most of us came here or many of us came here by boat, right? So many of us were, you know, what we would call today illegal immigrants, right? Many of us came that way and we got asylum when we made it here when we're fleeing from our country. Now, the reality is this, the reason we came to America is not because we were looking for to be amongst African American people, nor did we come here because we were looking to be amongst European American people. That's not why majority of foreign black people, especially Haitian, why we leave our land. Most immigrants, regardless of where you're from in the world, regardless of your skin color, you see America as the land of opportunity. That's your perspective. That's the viewpoint that you have of America, right? So that means if I come to America because I see it as a land of opportunity, guess what I'm here to do? Take part of those opportunities, take advantage of those opportunities. That's the only thing I care about, right? You don't risk your life and get on a boat, right? You're fleeing from poverty. You're fleeing from, you know, maybe a, a horrible government, whatever it may be. You don't go through that because you want to come to a country and fight the native people. You don't go through that because you want to have political wars about your skin color. Like who, like really, who gives a crap about that? Like when you really put it into perspective, like who really cares about that? Right? So for me being a foreign black person and seeing the risk my parents took to get me here, being attacked made absolutely no sense until this day. I, I can't say that it does, but what it did do is create this thing in me and I can't describe it. And I'm going to try to articulate it. It created this thing in me that said, you people are unsafe. And I'm saying that intentionally, you people are unsafe. That's what it created inside of me. It being attacked in the nineties by African-Americans, by black Americans, it created this sense in me that African-Americans are extremely unsafe people, that they're the most unsafe people on the face of this earth. You follow? Like, no, you guys are the people that I want no part of. I want nothing to do with because you're a ticking time bomb. I don't know when you can set off at any given moment for no reason whatsoever. You might want to harm me. You might want to hurt me. You might want to just let out your anger on me. So if that's the way you view somebody, wouldn't it make sense to stay away from them? If that's the way you view somebody, wouldn't it make sense to separate yourself from them? Right? So as time goes on, I lived a life completely separated from African um, American culture. Right. And then it made it even easier that I was raised Haitian. So I do have my own culture that I can be, you know, familiar with. So as time went on and I got older and, you know, election seasons, especially this last one um, that happened. Oh, my goodness. That 2020 election. Ooh, 2020 was one thing. Right. 
But 2016, right, was a crazy election. And I'm, I'm more of an apolitical person. And this is not so much of a political conversation. This is more of a social conversation. So I'm paying attention to this and I'm seeing this white people hate us. They're the devil, you know, and I'm seeing this conversation happen. I'm like, hold on, wait, if anybody's the devil, it's you. You get where I'm coming from? Like, how are white people the devil? When I came to America, white people didn't hit me. You did. White people didn't belittle me. You did. White people didn't tell me that I'm nothing. You did. White people didn't try to, like, harm me. You did. So if white people are the devil, why were you acting like one? You get me? Now it transformed from being people that you should have no parts of to being people that now you should be concerned with because they're mentally ill. I'm just taking you through the process of me kind of like being a foreign black person, right? And I know this might be a lot of tough for people to hear because what I learned is that when it comes to conversations like this, which is why I avoid it at all costs, I realize that it's so charged emotionally that even if you're telling the truth and it's the real truth of what you experience, if it doesn't fit into a particular narrative, people want to shut it down. They want to kill it. You know, no, you're not supposed to say that. No, you're only supposed to speak in this way. Again, this is the whole point why this conversation needs to happen so that this whole group thing, this whole, you know, fake kumbaya thing can stop because it's not the truth. It's really just not the truth. There are people that have different experiences, right? And go through this process and the 90s and now looking at these election cycles and then now we're we're in a day to day in this day and age where you're seeing you know this idea that white skinned people are the worst people on earth and if you ask a lot of foreign black people and as african american people you know what i'm talking about if you ask a lot of foreign black people you know who do they fear Barely any of them will tell you that they fear white skinned people. Barely any. Most foreign black people will tell you that they fear African Americans. They fear black Americans. You follow what I'm saying? That's the people who they don't want to experience. That's the people who they don't want to be around. I understand that that's tough to hear, um, but that's the truth, right? And why will they say that? Because they have real life experiences where they were bullied, where they were picked on, where they were mistreated. We can literally, you can start a forum on foreigners that will tell you the way they were treated by African-American people. So then now today in this age, you'll say, you'll hear African-American people say, man, foreign people, you know, you guys look down on us. You know, you think you're better than us and all these different things, right? But the reality is this, is that anyone that escapes to America, and this is across the board, immigrants who come here do not come here to get involved in political wars. Immigrants who come to this country do not come here because they want to come fight the people in this country. It's not why you come here. You come here with a different mindset. So the reality is, is that immigrant people come to this land because they want an opportunity and they feel like this is the land where they're going to get it. But the experience by African-American people has made it so tough to be able to do that. So now time goes on. Some people assimilated. When that process happened, that 90s war, and you'll speak to different Haitian people, it wasn't until like the 2000s, mid 2000s, early 2000s-ish, where being Haitian became cool now. This is when, you know, Wyclef and, you know, different people, you know, you had Garcelle Bouvet um, from Jimmy Fox showed, like you just had all these different Haitian figures that were kind of, you know, representing the culture, right? Or representing our community. And then be, oh, suddenly being Haitian became a cool thing. So prior to Haitians becoming cool, when we were bullied, when being Haitian was the worst thing that you could ever be, you had real Haitians like a Jean-Jacques Pierre who would say, no, they're not Haitian. They're actually French or whatever it may be, right? So what they would do is they would completely disassociate themselves from being Haitian at all, but you can't, I don't fault them. They were trying to survive essentially, right? And not only were they trying to survive, they were trying to assimilate. So there were Peters of the group, right? You remember how, you know, Jesus said, Peter, you'll deny me three times, right? So we had Peters in the Haitian community. They're like, no, mm -mm, I don't know those Haitian people. Haitian who? Haitian what? Your name is Jean-Jacques Pierre. You know, like, what do you mean you're not Haitian? Nope. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. So me, I couldn't hide from it. Basically, if there was a stereotypical looking Haitian, I was that. There was no high. I'm talking about like I was so childlike in the way my mom raised me and so like in somewhat way sheltered in the way that she raised me, like where there were certain progressions that girls were making. 
I was delayed. And I'll give you an example so you can really get like how there was no way I could even hide that I was Haitian. Like when I was in the seventh grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, like girls were already wearing weaves. I come from a household where weaves, what's that, right? Well, my mom was still doing my hair with bow knockers. That's what we called them. So basically, you know, like those little cute little barrettes that girls do that has like the two little balls. My mom was doing my hair like that. First of all, the fact that I'm telling you my mom was doing my hair in the sixth, seventh grade should already say enough, right? But she was doing my hair. And this, so I would come to school. The girls have on full weave and that whole bit. And no, I am looking like a little girl. So they would quote unquote say I look like a Haitian, right? So even if I wanted to hide, there was no way of hiding. And to add, you know, more fuel to the fire, you know, I grew up somewhat poor. So growing up somewhat poor, um, my mom's limited on the amount of resources that she has. And, my, and, and especially growing up in a Haitian culture, they prioritize things. So meaning you looking fresh to death at school, that was not our priority at all whatsoever. Growing up Haitian, going to school, you get five pairs, of, at least for me, right? I, like I said, I grew up poor. So... Um, you get five pairs of shirts, five pairs of pants and two shoes. That's it. That's what you're wearing for the rest of the year. Right. So I became so creative because I had to make that thing work. I had to make it look good. Right. As many times as I could. The point about it is, is that they call this, you look Haitian, you follow, at least for me. Um, and many people that I knew. So I'm saying this to say that many people assimilated. So when the 2000s, 2003 came into play, that's when, you know, a lot of these Haitians now are coming out of woodwork that you thought the whole time were black American. And they're like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, my Haitian people. my and, and a lot of Haitians to this day, they do not mess with, like, when Haitian Flag Day come, you will see it. They're like, uh-huh, this is when the fake Haitians, you know, come out, the ones that when we're really going through it, you guys weren't Haitian. You'll still see that type of conversation. But, again, these people assimilated so that they wouldn't have to deal with, you know, the impact of being Haitian. So I say all that to say that still exists today. So can you imagine you're li you come to a country for an opportunity, you're coming to take advantage of the opportunity here, your parents risk your lives to get you here, and people that look like you attack you and abuse you for being Haitian. You follow? For They look like you for being different. And now they try to say to you in this year that, no, I'm not the person you should be afraid of. The person that physically hit you, the person that physically attacked you, the person physically bullied you is not the person that you should be afraid of. It's the person that never laid a hand on you. It's the person that, you know, it's the, it's the color. I'm not the color that you should be afraid of. You should be afraid of that color because that color is the reason I am what I am. Think, think of this because that's essentially the argument for those foreign black people that had real life experiences with African American people, with black American people. The whole argument here is we look like each other. You should not be afraid of me. So ignore the fact that I bullied you. Ignore the fact that I dehumanize you. Ignore all of this. Ignore every negative experience that you had with me and only fear this skin color. Ignore the facts and fear this. Why? Because of what happened 400 years ago. What happened 300 years ago? What happened 200 years ago? This is why you should ignore what happened in the last 10 years because what happened in the last 400 years ago was more important. You should ignore an experience that you actually had and care more about experience that you never had. That is the logic that we're living in today. And this is as a foreign black person, this is the type of mentality that you actually have to navigate around. And it's so difficult to have these conversations because I know that we can get to a point of healing, but in order to get to a point of healing, we have to deal in reality first. You follow? If you're dealing with people, a group of people that are unwilling to deal with reality, how do you heal? Right? Because no matter what you say, if you're talking to a foreign black person that had real life experience with black American people, especially that went through the nineties when we're being abused for simply being foreigners, there's no way that you can convince them that the most evil people on the face of this earth has white skin. When I have real bruises, and real trauma from dealing with you. And I think that's what we really need to talk about. We need to talk about the trauma of experiencing black American people. Now, I understand that for a lot of many black Americans, they're going to say that this trauma, the only reason you're experiencing this trauma is because I still have trauma from 400 years ago. I get it, but I'm Haitian. We were enslaved as well. So how do we mend this? How do we get to a point where we can step into reality? Because again, I cannot define every single African-American person by the demographic of African-American people that treated me this way. It took so many years for me to finally understand 
that the demographic that treated me this way is a specific demographic. It's a specific type of African-American people. It took years to understand this, right? That this was not the collective thoughts. This is not the collective treatment that African-Americans across the board gave, right? But I had to be willing to understand that. I had to be willing to see that. I had to be willing to think that that's even possible, right? Well, in the same way, as an African-American person, at what point do you get to say to yourself that it was a specific demographic of white-skinned people that literally are responsible for racism, that are uh, responsible for creating this environment? Even though we were all impacted by it, a specific demographic of white people are responsible for this. You follow what I'm saying? Now, I understand that it's deeper than that, um, and I understand that it means more than that. But what makes more sense, right? to hold on to experiences that you actually had or to hold on to experiences that somebody else had that they passed on to you? What makes more sense to be more emotional about? Listen to the question again. What makes more sense to be emotional about? Does it make more sense to be more emotional, more, more impacted, more affected by experiences that you actually had yourself or to actually be more emotionally impacted by experiences that several generations had before you, but the information and the knowledge has been passed on to you. What makes more sense, right? You would say the former, of course. What I physically experienced makes more sense to hold on to than what I did not experience. So for me as a Haitian person, it makes more sense for me to say, man, I actually know African-American people in this way. You follow? It makes sense. But it's by the grace of God that I was able to forgive. It's by the grace of God that I was able to forgive. It's by the grace of, because those people are still living today. Those people are still walking this earth today. You follow what I'm saying? Those people are still around. Matter of fact, that culture is still there today, but it's by the grace of God that I was able to forgive and I had to forgive because what do they say? They say, when you hold on to unforgiveness or when you hold on to resentment, it's as if you are drinking poison, expecting the other person to die. And I think the one big thing that is so difficult, especially in America for African-American people, black American people, is the idea of letting go. I know people say let go of slavery. I'm not saying let it go. <sighs> the idea of accepting it. I think there's a level of accept. I think that there's a level of acceptance that's not here. And I'm watching a culture I'm watching a culture be destroyed by their own collective group thinking. And the one thing I want to make sure I never do, and I'm not going to do, is create this environment that says, yeah, let's point out all the flaws about black American people. We're not doing that. We're not doing that because we can run down the list of every single culture, no matter what color, no matter what ethnicity, no matter what nationality, and we can read them all for filth, right? We can do that, right? But the reality is this, the reason I'm addressing the black American culture is because ultimately at the end of the day, your voice is one of the loudest. Problem is this, is that you're speaking collectively for black skin in a way that all black skin does not agree. You're bringing forth black skin issues that all black skin people do not agree are the issues. You follow? So what I'm essentially saying is that in the 90s, I was able to be singled out by black Americans so easily and they were able to say, you're not one of us, you're different from us. And even today in 2023, I can say to you, I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem that a black American looks at me and says, you're not one of us. I don't have a problem that a black American looks at me and says, you're different from us. I don't even have a problem that a black American looks at me and says, I don't like you because you're different. I can accept all of that. You follow? I can understand all of that. But what I have an issue with is when that same black American person says, us black people, we black people, black, 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 black. No, because how do you have enough understanding to know that we're different when we arrive as foreigners, but then when you speak about your experience, you classify us and generalize us as all being the same. It's not right, right? So what I'm saying to you is that it's so important to get to a point of speech where we stop identifying ourselves by our skin color. And I know that sounds crazy. Well, what are you saying? Are you saying that you're not proud to be black? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. I love my skin. I was so, being a Haitian person, I was, this happened before this whole, you know, black thing even became a trend. 
I was so comfortable and I still am. I'm so comfortable in who I am in my blackness that I'm like, man, I just feel like I have to be 100% African, right? Like I just have to be. So I was just curious. This goes back to, um, what year? I want to say about... 10 years ago, about 10 years ago, if not more, I did an ancestry DNA test, which I still have some conversations about that, but I did an ancestry DNA test. You know what I found? I'll tell people every year I add 2%, but 94% African, 94% my blood makeup. And it says 6% European. I always tell people that 6% is probably from sniffing the same air, <laughs> right? I have my family, they have no recollection of any European person ever being in our bloodline, but how far back can we go? right? So we don't know along the way. We don't know, but 94%, 94%. So as a Haitian person, and, and I understand why that is because so many, you know, Haitian people, we, we got out of slavery very early. So a lot of us still have, you know, the purest form not being in Africa of like, quote unquote, African blood, because we didn't necessarily go through a lot of that assaulting, right? That happened. So I'm, I bring this up to say, I was so happy to see that. I wanted to see a hundred, but I got 94, right? Which I still feel like if you ask me, that's a thoroughbred, right? The point of it is that not wanting to identify as quote unquote black has nothing to do with me rejecting my blackness. If anything, it has me to do with rejecting white supremacy. And what I mean by this is this, and going back to the original question, why do you call yourself black? Because if I ask you as a black person who calls themselves black, which you're, you find us more in America, in America you find more black people that say I am black, right? But why do you call yourself black? Most of you are gonna say, because that is how I am seen. Isn't that insane? Let me, let me break it down to you and let me paint a picture to you. What if you were speaking to someone and you said, why do you call yourself ugly? They said, well, because the world calls me ugly. What if you were speaking to someone and you say, why do you call yourself dumb? Because the world called me dumb, that they see me as being dumb. You follow what I'm saying? Your entire identity of blackness in America is based on how you are perceived by the outside. That is insane to me that there is all this fighting, there is all this passion, there's all this vigor for an identity that was given to you. Why do you call yourself black? Why do you associate yourself with your skin color? Outside of the realm of systematic racism and white supremacy, there is no other reason why you as a black person will call yourself black. But yet, and, and if that's what you wanted to do, okay then. The problem now is, is that now you're now, it feels like putting pressure on other people black skin people to do this very same thing. And I'm telling you right now as a black foreigner, do not do that. Do not begin picking up this idea of identifying yourself by your skin color. For what? For what? Who are you appeasing by doing this? What, what are you perpetuating by doing this? By being so obsessed with identifying your skin color, you're doing the job of white supremacy for it. By being so obsessed by identifying yourself by your skin color, you're doing the job of systematic racism for it. Skin color has no inherent traits. Skin color has no inherent behaviors. Skin color has no inherent characteristics. Skin color has no inherent behaviors, no, in there, no inherent thought. Skin color has no inherent culture. It's skin. It is skin. Because you say you are black does not mean now I now have an idea stereotypically of what you eat. Because you say you are black does not mean I now have an idea stereotypically of the kind of music that you like. Because you say you are black does not mean that now stereotypically I have an idea of basically the things that you like to enjoy, the type of things, the type of things that you're into, the sports that you're into, the entertainment that you're like saying that you are a black skinned person absolutely gives me no absolutely idea of who you are, the characteristics you have. Even knowledge that you may have about certain figures, it says absolutely nothing. It is a skin color. You follow what I'm saying? However, if I say I am Ethiopian, you might now be able to add more specifics and say, oh, okay, well, do you like this? Do you like that? If I say I'm Haitian, you may say, oh, really? Okay, well, are you familiar with Griot? Are you familiar with Ligium? That gives you the ability to say, oh, okay, we can relate a little bit. Saying you are black is not this like relatability instantly. It doesn't mean that culturally we understand or know each other. It means absolutely nothing. It's skin color. And I think the hardest part in America that a lot of people here are going to have a hard time is getting to the point where your culture is not your skin color, getting to the point where you have an identity beyond your skin color. And that's the one thing that's so unfortunate that black skin people in America 
um, that were born in America that um, especially extend from the ancestors who were slaves in America. The one horrible thing that unfortunately impacts and affects you guys is that you don't have, you don't get to declare what your culture is beyond your skin color. In your eyes, your skin color is your culture. And the problem with that is that now you encounter all these different black skin people and you reject them because you can't relate. Hence what happened in the nineties. You re you reject them because you're like, no, you're not, you're not like me. What's wrong with you? There's something wrong with you when there's absolutely nothing wrong. We're different. We're not a monolith, but so badly in America is very difficult to, to believe that we're, we're not a monolith. We want to be seen as that and we're not. And the hardest thing you're going to have to accept is how different we are and that our skin color is just that, is skin color. The only purpose skin color ever served in our history was slavery. There is no other, there is no other instance that you can put beyond that that put a high price and a high priority on our skin color, as tough as that is. I know there's all this gods and goddesses talk. I know that there's all this... Um, I know that there's all this divinity talk about our skin color. No, it's skin. It's skin. And somebody was wicked enough and evil enough to basically use it and weaponize it against us. It's no, I could sit here right now and say, thin lips people are the most evil people on the face of this earth. I can start a movement right now where I, I tell society that you need to be afraid of thin lipped people, that every dictator, you know, every person that has ever done an evil crime, the most heinous and most wicked crimes in the world have all been committed by thin lips people. I can create a fear. I could put a fear in the heart of the entire globe by making them fear thin lipped people thin lips people beware of the thin lip people and guess what that thing may it's going to begin to snowball and trend but guess what's going to happen with that fear eventually someone's going to act on, out on it someone's going to see a thin lip person they're going to be afraid and they're going to say oh my gosh there goes those thin lip people i don't know if they're going to attack me let me hurry up and you know protect myself you can weaponize this idea of being a thin lip person we could start a movement right now and weaponize thin lip people be afraid of thin lip people but you know what happened? Maybe decades will go by, maybe centuries will go by. And eventually there's gonna be some intelligent person that says, guys, this is stupid. There is no inherent traits or behaviors or characteristics when it comes to being a thin-lipped person. Thin-lipped people, on behalf of all the non-thin-lipped people, you know, we apologize, you know, we're, we're removing this whole idea. We're no longer participating in this system of basically ostracizing and defranchising thin-lipped people. Imagine, can you imagine right now, if you have thin lips, you're like, man, fillers go through the roof, right? Imagine if being a thin-lipped person was literally seen as wickedness, evil. You were associated with every vile thing on the face of this earth. And then eventually, years go by, Generations after generations are born into this culture of thin-lipped people being the most evil people on the face of this earth. And then suddenly now that's no longer the case. Here's the thing though. After so many years of perpetuating this fear about thin-lipped people, even though thin-lipped people may no longer be something that people attack people for, not necessarily all the time. It's not the same way, but you know what hasn't necessarily left the stigma. And that's the thing about slavery, I think that we're combating in today's day and age is that the... How can I say this? The consequences of being black in the same way it was in the times of slavery don't necessarily exist the same way. The actual consequence, the brutality, the cruelty, it doesn't exist in that way, but the stigma still does. And the stigma is still powerful enough to create the dynamics we have today. The stigma of being black is still powerful enough to create you know, scenarios that we did today. So what do you do when you are dealing with a group of people that are essentially ostracized for something they have absolutely no control over, which is their looks, and there's a stigma that carries them, that follows them for having those looks. There's a stigma that follows them for being different physically, physic literally being born, being born different. So many things that people are talking about, I'm born this way, I'm born that way, you can hide that. Majority of the things that people talk about, they can hide it. You can't hide being black. You follow? You can't hide it. So can you imagine God, the creator of heaven and earth, creates you and then now you say, oh my goodness, he created something that we need to fear physically. That is one of the conditions that we're dealing with today in America. And that's one of the things that, you know, you have to resist and push back against, which is, and you're going to feel it more from, honestly, as a black skin person, you're going to feel it more from black skin people than you are anywhere else 
which is this you need to identify as being your skin color or else. That's where you're going to feel it the most. You're going to be ostracized, bullied, picked on. But again, and then so I see so many black skin people, foreign black skin people falling into this. But I want you to take a step back and ask yourself, why are you identifying by your skin? Literally. Like, I know why I'm Haitian. I know what that means to me. I understand there's a country called Haiti. I understand the people of that country are called Haitian people. I understand that we see ourselves this way. I eat see. Like, I get this, right? You might understand why you see yourself as being Nigerian. Nigerian. Because you're from Nigeria, right? You might understand why you call yourself African because you're on, you know, the continent of Africa, like whatever it may be. But black, black itself, outside of systemic racism, what other reason is there to identify as black? Outside of systemic racism, what other reason is there to identify as black? What other reason is it so important to identify yourself by your skin color? So you guys are bullying people to identify as an identity that was given to them by oppressors. You guys are trying to make people feel shame and peer pressure them into identifying themselves by their skin color. Why? Because that's the way white people see them. So, oh, so now racists don't have to do that anymore. Force you to see yourself as black. Remember that scene in Roots? What's your name? Kuta Kinte. No, Toby. What's your name? Kuta Kinte. No, Toby. So essentially what you guys are doing is saying, what are you? Haitian. No, black. What are you? Jamaican? No, black. What are you? Ethiopian? No, black. You're doing a job of systematic racism for them? I don't get to be Kutakente? I need to be Toby? That's what blackness is. Blackness is Toby. Calling yourself black, identifying by your skin color, that's Toby. If I call myself Nigerian, Kutakente, if I call myself Gaini Kutakente, I have a culture that I belong to. I have an ethnicity that I belong to. And the only reason you want me to not identify as that is because it serves you. Because you don't feel like that's the identity I should have. The only reason you want me to identify myself as black because you don't feel like I should identify myself by anything other than that. But when I was in the 90s and I came here, you wanted me to know I'm Haitian. When you were bullying me, you wanted me to know I was an African booty scratcher. Make it make sense. All right, guys, let's talk about it. So again, I ask, what reason do you have to call yourself black outside of systemic racism? And this is where I'm saying is that we need to make sure that we're not perpetuating those ideas and ideologies. Because I argue that by the sheer idea of forcing people to identify themselves as black, that within itself is a perpetuating of systemic racism. And it is time for more black people to feel the courage to identify themselves as what really has value to them, such as your culture, your morals, your values, your beliefs. So what if the outsiders say, no, you're black? No different than I would say, so what if they say that you're ugly? So what if they say that you're dumb? So what if they say that you're stupid? Why should you identify yourself by something that people call you, regardless of how collectively the people externally outside of you believe in this identity? What identity do you believe in? What identity belongs to you? And you will find that there is no identity in skin color outside of systemic racism and slavery. You will find your identity is going to be in your values and your cultures, right? and your, your belief system, your religion has absolutely nothing to do with your skin color. And no matter contrary to popular belief, no matter how hard you have these passionate black figures that want you to think otherwise, the reality is, is that they don't realize how hard they're fighting to perpetuate systemic racism. You are fighting so hard to be called what the white man called you, which is you're black and you're a N-word. Congratulations. You now hold the baton and you're doing a wonderful job. All right, guys, till next time.